Dugat's here for a hotel tonight. Guys, I know you don't like planning things to do, but your lady will be happy if you set up date night and book a room with Hotel Tonight. Trust me, I have the app. It's fantastic, and it's only an app. Not a website. It's just an app. Hotel Tonight partners with great hotels to get you incredible deals for tonight, tomorrow, and beyond. That's right. Don't be fooled by the name. It's not just for tonight. You got to get this app, guys. You can wait until the last minute and still score a crazy good deal at a super cool hotel, or you can actually book in advance if you're more of a planner. It's an app only, which means it's really easy to use, and you can book a room in like 10 seconds. Seriously, time yourself. Do it. I've done it. Uh, you'll be amazed at how quick and easy it is to use. They've got little profiles of each hotel with a fun summary of all the info you need to know and pictures of what the rooms really look like. And they also have a cool HD perks program where the more you book, the better the deals get. And it's not like other loyalty programs where you're trapped into staying at boring chain hotels. So download the Hotel Tonight app today and start booking better deals at better hotels now. Something better just came along. Hotel Tonight. In my yard, I'm a grill master. But weeds have invaded this backyard barbecue kingdom. With Scott's Turf Builder Weed and Feed, you can thicken your lawn and kill over 50 pesky weeds guaranteed. Because Scott's Weed Grip technology is twice as effective on dandelions and clover as it used to be. So you can defeat invaders and green up your grass. It's my secret recipe for a great looking lawn. This is a Scott's Yard. Pick up a bag of Scott's Weed and Feed today. Oh, what? Sweet love. Oh, uh, yeah. We finally got a good basketball oh. game. Oh, yeah. Well, I haven't seen a good basketball game in a month. Yeah, felt good. Who had that? <laughs> what, us seeing a good basketball game in yeah. the playoffs in a month? Yeah, precisely. <laughs> precisely. Oof. What a game. Oh, I miss basketball. What a performance. Yes. From Chris Paul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you going to give him credit? I don't know. I'm going to do it again. Yeah, that, you That's what superstars do. I mean, listen, you did it once. Now do it uh, Do it a couple more times, and I'll be impressed. And I'm not even certain how good of a game it was. To be honest with you. I, I miss those defensive struggles. I really do. Uh, it was refreshing to see something like that. I, I had a take yesterday. Well, I had a couple bad takes, apparently, because the Rockets proved yeah. me wrong. <laughs> Because yeah. uh, I thought that that series was over in what, five. What did I say to you seconds after you dropped me off? I think it was halfway through the second quarter. Warriors in six? I think I said Warriors in five. I think I said yeah. it's over. Basketball is ruined. Yeah. Well, we all like, were... What did you say? No, I agreed with you. Yeah. I'm like, I finally came around to mean it's sake that the Warriors ruined basketball. <laughs> right. I mean, how could you think otherwise really after that third it. quarter, honestly? And how does a team with that kind of offensive firepower have put up, ever have a quarter in which they scored 12 points? Ever. They shot three for 18 in the fourth quarter. <laughs> three for 18. <laughs> They're four all-stars. Shot two for 16. 0 of 6 from 3. And let me tell you something. This Steph Curry. Yeah. Anytime I watch this guy in a tight game, which isn't often. Mm -hmm. It doesn't often happen with him. Anytime I watch him in a tight game, lemon booty. He he, he misses wide open layups. Oh, he's hurt in the fourth quarter, Mike. He misses wide open layups. He misses. This guy is the greatest shooter of all time. Yes, but it was it was dramatic. It was a really bad miss, and they got a gift of a call right after that because Sean Livingston pushed Chris Paul into Draymond right. Green. Yes, Draymond Green make both free throws. By the way, come yep. on, yep. come on now. Missed that dunk though. Yeah, I'm uh, not talking about that. He did miss that dunk. That was man. horrible. Steph Curry missing two wide open threes I after mean, making even... like twenty impossible. Yeah, dads. but that last one with point five. I mean, that's as good he, of a look yeah. as you're gonna get. Did he even get it off in time? Oh, he got it off. In he time. got it off in he time. He just missed. Yeah, because he was hurt. Okay. Well, the one before that, too, was really bad. I think it came in like the three-minute mark where Kevin Durant found him wide open. Yeah. God, what what happened to them? They were 51-0 with when leading by 15 points in the third quarter in their history mm-hmm. as, a, as a unit. Yeah. 51-0. That, it's amazing because in the two years that Durant's been with the Warriors, you know, for them to be up that many times by 15 is pretty incredible. We've never seen that happen. No. Regular season or postseason. It was startling to watch their offense become inept. And credit to James Harden, who gets picked on a lot defensively, especially. Played well. He played really well. They were attacking him, and he stepped up to the challenge. I thought he really did. Harden did. I think the most valuable thing he did 
was it looked like Golden State was going to blow them out early on, Mike. It yeah, did. all the Warriors right. scored before they scored. And then Harden just kept them in the game by himself until the other guys got comfortable. Well, after he didn't take that wide-open shot, you thought, oh, this is going to be one of those James Harden games where we all clown him mercilessly, right. but then he followed that with the Draymond dunk, mm-hmm. and he kind of flipped the script. Right. Warriors had a 95% chance of winning that game in terms of Ooh. win probability. I don't understand it. I, 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 honestly, I do not, on their home court, with those four guys, now Iguodala was out last night, glue guy, <laughs> but those four guys, how you put up 12 points on your home court, Western Conference Finals <laughs> game four, I don't get it. It was stunning to see, and now all of a sudden, you realize, you sit back, and you say, oh crap, the Rockets have two out of these three games at home. Mm. They're not going to win. I know. They're, yeah, they're gas. They they played seven guys. They went full D'Antoni this game. He hit the panic button, and they're not going to win the next game. They're going to be favored in the next game, right? I, I saw that. I think they I are. Think I think they're minus be, yeah. one. Yeah. I, I'd bet against them. Yeah. Okay. You'd bet against them. So well, how do you think the series goes? Warriors and six? Warriors and six. I mean, Same. what we saw last night was so unprecedented that I don't think that the Rockets figured something out. I refuse to believe a team that has James Harden on defense can do that multiple times to the greatest team we've ever seen. I refuse to believe it. They missed shots, Mike. I they, can't believe they what were happened. Nine of 27. They have so many other good guys on defense. They have all those athletic guys like Tucker. and It's not like just James Harden. They have a really good defense. Didn't they have like a top, top 10 five, regular yeah, season? Top, yeah. five. Top, fi- top five. Wow. Yeah, but they have James Harden. Yeah, the Warriors have Steph Curry. <laughs> Steph Curry wasn't as bad as James Harden was. And now they seem comparable. He must not be healthy. I don't understand what it is. Healthy in the third quarter, though, stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Super healthy. Unhealthy in the fourth. But they're missing wide-open <laughs> shots, too. It wasn't just great. Like, they had so many open looks in the final four minutes of that game. And their offense was constipated. I'm not used to seeing that. Well, they were taking terrible sh- They looked like the Rockets... In the first game, where they were taking horrible shots, running down the clock, just forcing isos over and over and over. Did Durant take a single shot in the final four minutes of the game? A shot. Mm. I, I think, don't think he took a shot in the final was, four minutes no, there of the was game. One, there was one that uh, there was a three that hit the side of the backboard. Oh, I saw that. that was I think that's when he stopped shooting, though. That was contested by your yeah. boy, Chris Paul, yeah. who finally had the game. Still not certain. Oh, Do you, it again. You, are you just going to pick on his assist numbers? Uh, I am, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, when I'm, when I'm sitting around watching LeBron put up the numbers that he puts up and everyone's calling Chris Paul an all-time great, and you're going to hand me four assists, I mean, get out of here. I mean, LeBron's believe. not playing with James Harden. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, just do it again. That's it. And then when you're and done do doing it again. it again, do it again, because that's what great players do. LeBron doesn't take nights off. He yeah. does it, and then he does it again, and then he does it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And that's what I want Chris Paul to do. So you want him to do it again twice. Then get to the finals and do it again four times? Four more times, yep. All right. No, and then after that, in August, he wants him to do it again, even though there are no games being played. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even if he does it again, you know, six more times, I'm still not certain he's going to win a ring in my personal record book. Haven't, uh, haven't really thought that one through yet. If the, if the Warriors lose this series, are you going to pivot from Chris Paul to Seth Curry? Because it's looking like that for me. Yeah, yeah probably. It's yeah. looking like that for me. I'm so, I want this guy to be so great. Because I was told he was great. I thought he was better than LeBron. You told three me he years was ago. great. You. The numbers you. said he was better than LeBron three years ago. And he, he shriveled up and everyone blamed an injury. Okay. Well, what is it? You're out there in the quarter. You had an amazing, you're out there in the fourth quarter. You had an amazing third quarter. You're missing wide open layups. This is a trend that I've seen all too often whenever the game gets tight. He's just, He's just blessed that the game's How about the last tight. shot? How about the last shot? How about the look, look? How about the look they got him at the end? Not that it's an easy shot, but you're the best shooter in the history of the league. He he needs to start getting criticized more. I demand it. I demand it. I am challenging the national media. Mike, I've tried, and I'm telling you, it's nearly impossible. He's just adorable. He is really cute. Yeah, I mean, it's so just so Chris Paul though. So is Chris no, Paul. No, 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 no. He's not adorable. Wait a minute. Chris Paul's behavior is not adorable. Chris Paul himself is adorable. No, 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 no. Because he's small? Literally just because he's small. No, 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 no. That's why Steph gets it. No, 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 no. Especially with that hairline. It's the face. Steph has a much cuter face than Chris Paul. Way cuter. Yeah. Those eyes. When shaved, though, when he has the facial hair, he loses some of the adorableness from Well, he grows the facial hair to say, ooh, I'm a tough guy. 
guy. It can make a wide open no, layup, not. but you can't. No. Chris Paul's feistiness makes him cuter. No. no. He gets angry. No. 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 Do you think he's the most likable warrior? Uh, oh, I mean. yeah, yeah, until there's a close game and he's not great and it really well, frustrates yeah. me. Your other choices are great. Yeah, like Brady, Kevin warriors. Durant. He's tough. <laughs> it's a tough group. He's the most likable warrior. Oh, it's easy, I think. Clay? I mean, Clay. What, no Clay, one has Clay, any Clay, feelings I, about Clay Thompson. Uh, by the Positive way, or negative. He's just there. Uh, have a good game. How about that? I mean, game one, since game one, been a complete disaster. I might shift my attention to Clay Thompson at some point here. We'll see. <laughs> Oh, no. A lot of guys that I can go to here, man. That's the beauty of this series. The echo chamber is going to be such that no <laughs> one's going to remember your Chris Paul takes because everyone's just going to be crushing Kevin Durant and this Warriors team yeah. if they lose. And they might. They got two games on the road. Mm. Mike, he took his final shot, his final shot with about 340 to go on the clock. You can't go three minutes and 40 seconds, game four, Western Conference Finals. You're Kevin Durant. They brought you in there because, what well, again, I mean, because he's talented, but a crunch time, Kevin Durant can get his own shot in half court. How do you go three minutes and 40 seconds without taking a shot? Well, how about this? The things that we were asking when they first got together, even though the chemistry has proven to be beautiful, is who's going to take the last shot in close games? They never have close games. Last night, how'd that look to you at the end? in terms of what they were doing and what the plan was. Because uh, that I can't think of a worse shot than Clay Thompson helicoptering around trying oh. to create his own shot off the dribble, fading away from the basket. That that's the best you can get when those with those players on the floor. Mina, did you think uh, Steve Kerr should have called timeout there? So I was confused when he missed it, and then, well, first of all, the, the, should he have missed the foul shot? I was trying, I, I'm still confused about that. I've seen... Oh, Chris Paul should have absolutely missed that foul shot. I was because, screaming that he Kerr made it. But Chris said that he prefers, he doesn't like after... Sorry, I think just went out. He doesn't like after timeouts. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. My mic's going in and out. Anyways, well, first of all, Kerr said that they tried to call the timeout, right? Didn't he say that the refs ignored Draymond? I did not hear that. That's why I'm asking. Oh, okay. So, yeah, he blamed the refs for that. He said Draymond was trying to call it and that they didn't see him or something or they disregarded him. Uh, do you really believe that, though? If you want a timeout, yeah. you have five seconds to inbound the ball. The person inbounding the ball could look at the referee and call timeout. I haven't reviewed the tape and looked at Draymond yet, so I don't know if that's true. Or it not. just seems to be a bad excuse to me because I feel like you can call a timeout in that situation. The refs are anticipating you calling a timeout in that situation. You call a timeout there, though, you don't have the timeout with point five to draw up that play. Mm-hmm. So. Right, so Kerr was saying he doesn't like right. that you know, point five situation. Right. Afterwards. I kind of like letting those guys play, like those guys. I mean, you think right? Steph makes that shot, though, so... Point five should be enough for a shooter of his caliber. And we're, and we're positive he got it off. He was just way too <laughs> cash with point five. You saw the open look Durant passed up, right? Uh, no, I didn't see yeah. that. Before yeah. he realized that's that. why Clay Thompson oh, the, took the oh, shot. Oh yeah, that before he took. the, the yes. helicopter Clay Thompson yes. shot. Yeah, yes. I thought that was weird. Like if their if their offense is going to become shockingly an isocentric offense right. without ball movement, then why in God's name aren't you going to Kevin Durant, right. where he spent most of his career doing that bleep? It was very weird because I guess to Dan's point, they're not really in that situation and they're not now they're forcing sharing the ball like no 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 it's we're an unselfish team. In that moment, if you're gonna do what Kevin Durant's always done in his career, go to the seven foot shooting guard. Right. Did you see that they had the lowest number of assists they've had in the season or something? I don't understand. Why are they playing this way? Can someone explain that to me? Like why do they look like the bad rockets now? Is it just fluky? Houston's good at defense and plays small too. That good though? I mean, Houston's good at defense. I've been surprised that all of these games, all of them in the playoffs, don't feel like playoff games. Not playoff games that I remember. Like, these these scores are not the scores that you remember from playoff basketball. Right. Well, last night was, though. I know. Last yeah. night was. Yeah. And last night is both those teams dying and clawing for every second of the game. And at the end, it, and what Mina said is right, man. We would be crushing D'Antoni for that rotation if Eric Gordon doesn't make that three because he's exhausted. Because he was playing nobody last night. Good luck beating the Warriors the remainder of this series, giving Gerald Green those kinds of minutes and those kinds of shots. Well, at 12, I think Gerald Green. And get those kinds of shots, too. 
we're, we're dealing with relatively small samples, but it's pretty clear that the blueprint for the Rockets is both James Harden and Chris Paul have to play well, and James Harden has to just be okay on defense. When he's a disaster, they lose. If he holds somebody to you know 44% and less than a point per possession on defense, they're undefeated against the Warriors. When he's given up over 60% from the field, they lose. He's not going to play good defense in the next game. Neither is Chris Paul. Did you see the minutes they put up? They had like five or six guys put up more than 40 minutes. Did you see the minutes that the uh, the Warriors put up without Iguodala? Their rotation, I think the only person that didn't set a, a high in minutes was Clay Thompson. Thompson played 39, Curry 39, Durant 43, uh, Draymond 45. They played a lot of minutes without yeah. Iguodala there. Yep. Sensibly getting back. Have you guys ever wondered what the difference is between... 41 minutes and 39 minutes. Like, is it not confusing to anybody that the world's best athletes can play 39 minutes, but 41? No, 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 no. Seven minute difference. Hi, everyone. Stu Gatz here. Support for the Dan Levitard Show podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, and your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Stugatz, S-T-U-G-O-T-Z, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Don Lebatard. My mom, first visit, worried about her son, comes to the Worcester, which is the armpit of America. And within five minutes, a squat team rolls up. We think it's for my house. It's for the house next door. It's a crack house. My mom wanted to bring me home. A what team? A squat team. Uh, Is that what you call it? (laughs) Squat team? I don't know. Stugats. They had big guns. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. And a lot of armor. You think that the team that storms into your house and knocks over the door wearing uniforms as law enforcement. You have thought all your life that that's a squat team. They squatted. The people in the house. They well, the people squatters. in the house were squatting. <laughs> no, they came in with, like, guns blazing, and they had their armor on, and they all, like, got in the shooting position, and they were squatting. This is the Dan Levatar show with the Stugats on the ticket. All right, we have David Sampson coming up, by the way, in about 15 minutes to talk uh, movies and baseball. Maybe Mina Kimes can uh, try to trick the movie expert, David Sampson. Uh, but I wanted uh, to take this opportunity to speak with Chris Whittingham. Chris Whittingham of the ambiguous uh, WQAM 790, the ticket relationship that we were not <laughs> we're sure just we gonna, We're just going to pretend like they weren't rivals yeah, yeah, all along. Yeah. We're, apparently, we're all good now. Um, so, uh, and you have a new, uh, soccer podcast. Pitch I do, Invasion. yes. It's called, uh, Pitch Invasion. Uh, debuts today. Talk to Grant Wall of SI and, uh, another of the podcasts that we work with. Uh, is one of the guys a Liverpool fan is actually going to the Champions League final, so we talked to him. Witty's a, a a part of the extended Levitard Show family because uh, Witty, you you didn't necessarily get your start because you were doing nope. some stuff with uh, VUM, sure. But no, well, locally, actually, I, think, I think I started with you guys before I started VUM. Oh, really? So yeah, so, yeah he was uh, Chris Whittingham, another uh, successful member of the Levitard Show internship pro program that's no longer uh, active. And, and allowed, even though you guys hop in my mentions all the time. I'm sorry, guys. I, I, I cannot give you an internship. It is uh, not allowed by ESPN Radio. I, it's not allowed by ESPN. I figured it was just a space thing. No, like, where, well, I, where mean, would you I put literally somebody? can't put anybody in this studio <laughs> at all. It would have a corner of the table yeah, and couldn't do yeah. anything. But, uh, yeah, I'm actually very thankful that ESPN has that uh, policy. It doesn't make me the bad guy. It makes him the bad guy. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you because there is uh, some Miami MLS news. Yes, there is. And uh, I I don't have anybody to talk to about Miami MLS. We ha- we've we generally ignored it here on the local hour. But you're here. You just happen to be in the you studio. You want to talk to Stugatz about it? Uh, Stugatz, uh, I mean, we, I think we know his soccer takes. <laughs> I think uh, I think we're all well-versed in what he thinks about soccer. But uh, Michelle Kaufman, I yes. believe, mm-hmm. uh, reported the uh, the story yesterday that, the, <laughs> that there are several trademarks filed for the Miami MLS team. Uh, and uh, the name is Miami Freedom, um, and a lot of people are hating this name because it feels including Mina Kimes at exactly yeah, this moment in it time. It feels very um, lower division. It feels very 1990s well, soccer. Well, well, that that's the thing that I follow a lot of MLS people on Twitter, and that was the thing that kept get kept getting pointed out 
which was when the league started, they had all these very American names like San Jose Clash and Dallas Burn and all these ridiculous. And so they're calling it an MLS 1.0 name because MLS has kind of evolved now. And so it's like, well, hang on a minute. We're going backwards in time when basically every team that's come into the league has been United or City. But I can get what they're trying to do with that because Miami Freedom, I think this, this to me, it screams George Moss. This, this, all, this whole thing, when Moss came in and saved the team, I'm, I'm super thankful that Moss did this, but Moss really likes Moss. And I thought we had a stadium site, and now we, we don't, and we're, we're doing this thing again with a stadium. I saw that they applied for multiple names. Is it Miami Freedom? I saw they did Miami Freedom Football Club, Miami Freedom United, like. Well, yeah, well, they're, they're, the, the, the basis of it is Miami Freedom. Now they can turn it into an FC or a United or any of the other traditional soccer names, but the base of it is Miami Freedom. So Freedom might be an attempt to pander, I think, or just make it more communal. I, I imagine, like, there has to be. What are the odds on freedom on the Freedom Tower being on the on the team's oh, crest? Yeah, if they're Miami Freedom, it's got to be the Freedom Tower. Or it's not like a silhouette in the jersey or whatever. But I think you, w- one of the things that people were pointing out is that it's sort of a, a Cuban thing, right? That that Miami is a is a is a place where Cubans have found their freedom, and that the Freedom Tower has represented something to the Cuban community. But isn't that sort of uh exclusive just to the cubans and i mean our demographics obviously largely cuban down here Mm -hmm. but i'm not sure how big of passion uh how passionate the cubans are about soccer i think i mean baseball is the number one sport in cuba yeah and for cubans in miami but in but in soccer it's not necessarily the case you're going to be leaning on some of the south american demos down here more uh not i mean freedom is a concept that everybody can sort of get behind i think but freedom seems very slanted towards a Cuban base here, which isn't necessarily that passionate about soccer. Right. And so are, is this going to be something that South American people, they see the word freedom and they think, oh, freedom, I, I can get behind that. Like, I don't I don't understand if you're trying to go for cultural significance. I'm not sure that this is the word to be going for. Now, I generally find names or the right names to be really difficult to find. But I'm not sure that this is really something that, if it's meant to be a galvanizing thing for the community, I'm not sure that that really hits the mark. Well, Billy's boy, Andy Slater, actually has a, a Slater scoop. Um, apparently, Go Michelle on. Kaufman uh, didn't find the only trademark. Well, actually, so it was actually a bit of internet sleuthing that found this Miami Freedom thing. There was just a guy on Twitter who, like, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon yesterday, just tweeted out, hey, I think I found something, and it was... It was Miami Freedom and then all the Uniteds and FCs, and it was basically applying for trademark for all of the things that one would use in a soccer stadium, like to be used in stadium use, to be used on jerseys and all this stuff. And it seemed like that that was the only one that this internet sleuth found. Well, I'd actually like to get Billy's opinion on this, um, because Billy's been alienated by the, the Marlins uh, ownership <laughs> group. George Moss has saved soccer down here. I don't know, where, where did you... We'll see. I don't think you were crazy about George Moss when he was involved uh, initially in the talks. What, how do you feel about the George Marlins? Moss? Yeah. Oh, I love George Moss. He was the best. Are you okay. kidding me? I thought he was super rich, and I thought that be, this would be great. Now but I find out he's not rich. He's not super rich. <laughs> so he has a soccer team. But he has a soccer team. And, and or does he? I mean, are they ever going to play? Well, <laughs> that's the thing. Well, that I, I was conundrum. I wanted to hear from you because you're just typically a jaded uh, person. Cynic. Yeah, you're a cynic <laughs> when it comes to all things Miami. Um, so what does this team need to do to maybe get some disenfranchised Marlins fans like yourself out oh, I'm there? I'm not going to watch this soccer team. You're teams. not going no, – what care. sort of community outreach, what sort of name can, can yeah. they put on, on the team? They need to not play soccer for me to watch them. <laughs> hey, can we convince you with colors? Like no, a, like I went. Were... To, I went to one of those uh, – what is the soccer team that plays at FIU? Miami FC. I went to one of their games. It was fun enough. It was fun. Yeah, well, but I think. But what I'm. But but the thing about MLS is it's going to be that with an actually full stadium mm, and an environment we'll that's going yeah. to be fun. Do you don't think so? Full? You don't buy this? I don't know. Eh. You don't buy. I think the town's going to rally behind it. Um, Particularly I'm just, if like the current trajectory of the teams in this market continues on, which is either mediocre to bad. We don't exactly have a great track record when it comes to showing up. We've had a lot of good teams and well, showing up for what though, right? Because. Miami Fusion played either at the or Orange, Lauderdale. yeah, the Orange Bowl, or at Lockhart Stadium, the dilapidated awfulness that that is Lockhart Stadium. 
And if you, if just to me, when, because you went last year to the Juve game that was down here when they played uh, PSG, like when Peru plays here, there's like 45,000 people at Hard Rock Stadium. Like, if you correctly market yourself to, to me, the, the thing that's going to make MLS Miami work is that there are sports fans down here that don't go to any of the teams because they only like soccer. Mm-hmm. And so if you correctly bring in, Major European superstars, marketed South correctly, American superstars, or, or, right? Or South American superstars, you can basically create new customers to yeah. sports. Juve and PSG, they're drawing a crowd because they're Juve and PSG, and you're going to see Gigi Buffon, and you're going to see the stars. So right. I know PSG has an academy down here, but people are going to see the stars mm-hmm. and, and top tier clubs. Miami's MLS team is not going to be a top tier club, uh, at least internationally right. at first, but you're hoping that they can get a superstar. Billy, would you be inclined to see uh, uh, the Miami MLS team if they had someone kind of like, uh, I know there's a lot of names sort of rumored, but the hope is that a Ronaldo or Messi, David Beckham sort of leveraging the Adidas uh, relationship that he has. And Messi obviously already putting out that video saying, call me in a couple of years. Would you go see a Lionel Messi? Like an old washed up one? Well, I don't know. how An old washed up Messi. Messi mid-30s is going to be better than almost any American soccer player. Probably better. He will be better than any American soccer player. Better than any American soccer player. And he's still Messi. He's still incredibly famous. I saw a Bieber once. That was cool. (laughs) (laughs) So would you go to see a superstar? Would you? Would that get you excited? What's what's the season? Like, what months do they it, play? It is March to October. So it's basically oh, the baseball no. season. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, like, the first week of March or, like, the last game in October. It's too hot. This is an outdoor... No. This, by the way, Marlins <laughs> Park has completely spoiled me in terms of stadium experiences. Like, why do people play games outside? It's miserable. <laughs> it's hot. It rains. Like... If they have like an indoor stadium, which they won't, maybe. But if not, I'll go. Do they play in the morning, like in the afternoon or at <laughs> it'll night? Be, it'll be in night. the morning. In the morning, <laughs> yeah. the soccer yeah, yeah, games yeah. seems all be like at six uh, in the morning. Well, that's, 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 consider, that's considering how the Europe. stadium, considering how the stadium search has gone uh, for uh, the Beckham group, they might be playing in Marlin Stadium for a decade as they <laughs> as they figure things <laughs> out. Oh, but now I have the conflict of I don't want to give Marlin Park money. Oh, mm. yeah. That's going to be my reason not to go, not just because I don't like soccer. I think this uh, this ownership group will try their damnedest to make these games an event. MLS in the 90s kind of failed because not just these horrible team names, but because they were sort of going family-friendly and they were competing with all the other leagues that sort of cornered that market. Now I feel like MLS is, at, at least in attendance, the ratings still need some work to do, but at least in attendance... That's a, a real success story because they're sort of catering to the pub culture yeah. uh, and the whole like the brewery here, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come here, get drunk and sing songs and root for your team. And, you know, a couple times during a 90 minute game, something exciting will happen when you'll spill a drink. They, they deserve any amount of blame and criticism for things. But one of the things that they have managed to do is really find a formula, regardless of where they go. There is fan support. There are packed stadiums. Like if you look at the teams that have recently come into the league, Seattle, Portland, Atlanta, Orlando, like these are packed stadiums with fan cultures that rival fan cultures in Europe. As a matter of fact, there are Europeans that come here and say, hang on, this is better than England now because in England they've priced out the real fans that actually make the noise and sing the song. So like that, there will be no mistaking that this will be a party and this will look good on television and be a fun place to go. The question is, can they be good enough? Can they dr- can they get enough people through the door at the beginning to sort of see, oh, hang on a minute, this is going to be really fun because they just started LAFC, and LAFC would have all the same indicators that Miami would in terms of a struggling sports market, but it's really fun, and there's tons of people that go. Whose job is it to come up with the songs that we sing in the pubs? Well, it's it's the supporters groups, right? So, so are you? Do you want to apply for that? If we're called the Miami Freedom. Freedom, like we can play yeah, that yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, like, we can. You know, we can also do a Libet Dot, Libet Dot yes, chance, I yeah. guess too. So that's. Uh, are we warmer to getting Billy out there at all? <laughs> but you can sing George Michael and chant Libet Dot. Do you think I'm spending my time singing George Michael songs now? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Only half the time. Uh, David Sampson next. To give batters a different look, pitchers throw a changeup. Your idea of a different look is sunglasses. That's true. But La Quinta Inns and Suites is really taking the different look thing to a new level. Definitely a major league makeover, starting with a bolder, brighter lobby full of comfortable spaces to let you settle in. Or chill out in front of a big, flat screen like Wingo would. Oh, you know it. 
It's a changing La Quinta look to help you get in the zone and look sharp when you hit that big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. Don Lebatard. Where can we hurt Derek Jeter the most? Why do you want to right hurt Derek Jeter? in his wallet? Listen, Dan, I'm obviously very fair. I'm telling you the way things are. Stugatz. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I love this new character of Chris Cody as confused moral conscience in the back of the room. Why do you want to hurt Derek Jeter? He hurt me. I'm going to hurt him back, and I'm going to hurt him in the pocketbook. This is the Don Lebatar show with the Stugatz on the ticket. Former Marlins team president David Sampson. Good to join us to talk movies and baseball. He'll join us right now on the Orion Fuel and Downstairs Convenience Store guest line. They are truly steps beyond convenient. If you want to ask him any questions about movies, about baseball, about whatever, 786-456-4837 is the telephone number. We've got baseball stuff to talk to him about, but before we do that, let's review a movie. Uh, Mina is a movie fraud. Mina is someone who reads about movies so she can p- be part of the conversations around movies, but doesn't put the investment in into watching the movies. She camouflages it very well. We never know if she's seen a movie or hasn't seen it because she can fake her way through a conversation. She does to movies what Stugatz does in sports. Yes, me and Mike Ryan were convinced for a month that she loved Point Break the way we loved Point Break, and then she revealed to us she's never seen Point Break. She's a Cliff Notes person when it comes to the movies. It's a strange place to be a Cliff Notes person. (laughs) But Dave Sampson joins us now on 790 The Ticket. What are you reviewing for us this week, uh, David? I'm reviewing The Greatest Showman, which I think any Yelly should have seen, but wait to see. It is a musical, and I love musicals. It's not as good as Moulin Rouge. Hugh Jackman is extremely talented. I'm very okay telling you I like Zac Efron as well. I had never heard of Zendaya, and I didn't know it was her until I went through the credits and read about it at the end. If you can get past that they just break into song at very strange places, it's the story of P.T. Barnum and how he decided to become the greatest showman on earth. And it got not enough attention. It was nominated only for an Oscar for music. I thought the story was interesting. He is an American icon, and I think it's great that people are willing to take the chance and make a movie like that. I loved every minute of it, and I'm not embarrassed to have downloaded the soundtrack. What uh, What did you learn about P.T. P. T. Barnum that you didn't know? I didn't know how he started. I The way he started the circus, he was a down-and-out guy who had a tough childhood and just wanted attention, and he just wanted to be extraordinary. And all he did was spend his life, and now it makes perfect sense, right? He was an ordinary guy who just wanted to be extraordinary. And he made a home for all of the freaks and crazies and put him in the circus when it didn't have a pejorative tone. And he went through a lot of crap because people made fun of it. But then all of a sudden, they started coming and paying to see the bearded woman and tiny Tom Thumb. And he built it into an institution, ironically, that only disappeared last year because of all the PETA members and those who have been on safari and cannot understand how an elephant could be in a circus. David, I saw it as well. I liked the movie. I really did. I'm wondering, though, because I'm with you. I liked the movie. I'm, I'm not certain anyone was really praising it. Like, it seemed like everyone was criticizing that movie. Why do you think that is? Because it was campy, and yeah. it was sappy, and, and people may have misunderstood that it was Russell Crowe singing um, in Les Mis, but Hugh Jackman is a huge talent, but he's associated as Logan and Wolverine now, so it's hard to see him dance and sing, and Zac Efron is this sort of manly guy from Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates, and they forget where he started, so you just have to buy into it. With movies like this, and I bet you did the same things, Stu, uh, I bet you just have to sit there and just be drawn into it and allow yourself to like it, or else you will not. Yep, and I went into it with very low... My daughters wanted to see it, so my wife and I took them. I went into it with very low expectations, which always helps because it exceeded my expectations. I really enjoyed it a lot. That's a good thing to do in life, actually, Stu. Lower your expectations. Yes, (laughs) I've mastered that. Well, Stugatz is mad at you, too, Samson, because... uh, you you had with Jason Stark you you tried to make changes to baseball and and Stugatz has been making those changes uh, for a long time eighteen months what what upset you the most Stugatz about reading that David Sampson David Sampson was getting credit for revolutionizing baseball on stuff that you have said for for months and years yeah and Jason Stark tweeted it out imagine a world in which you know Mike Trout can you know bat in the ninth inning you can go out of order in the ninth inning to get your best players up in the best situations to which I responded to Jason uh, Stark's tweet 
It was an article about David Sampson, his conversation with him. I imagine that world over a year ago. Sampson, I'm thinking you got this idea from me. I'm just like, like, be honest here. Did you get the idea from me? You stole my ideas, dude. Yeah, I would never steal anything from you. This was actually discussed in a competition committee meeting, uh, I would say either one or two years ago. And I don't think they credited you for it, but it was so summarily dismissed. What I did with Jason Stark was just try to start a conversation. I'm not saying that any of the things I came up with can be done or should be done. But what I do think needs to happen is a conversation because I'm worried that baseball is not the national pastime anymore. And we're losing fans and our fans are getting older, the ones we have. And I think it's okay to have change. And I just wanted a conversation. But I'm more than happy to credit anybody with any idea. It's not about my ideas. It's about recognizing that the game I love is faltering, even though no one wants to admit it. What was the idea that you <laughs> liked uh, the best? Um, among the ideas that you presented, what was your favorite? I love the wild card at bat. Uh, and I also love the crooked number idea, which was pretty controversial. But one thing that hurts ratings and hurts attendance is a blowout. So my view is anytime you give up more than two runs, the next half inning, you get a chance to have a, a man start on second base. And then if you score more than two runs, then the other team gets that chance right back. So it's like an automatic rally start. And I think that's good for the game. It's exciting. But the one that means a lot is the wild card one. And Stu, if it's your idea, who cares? Great. I'm glad it's yours. Let's make it happen. Because I think it's it shouldn't be that the best player on your team doesn't have a chance to help your team at the end of the game. Just picture LeBron James not having a chance to have the ball at the end of a Cavs game. It just doesn't make sense to me. David, it has nothing to do with you, really. It has to do with when I say it, everyone laughs at me. When you say it, it makes national news. They still laugh at him. I don't know if anyone's laughing I, at him. Did you hear that cockamamie idea he just came up with, the immediate rally starter? Not There's no one in our audience who agreed with not that. Not his best, and he definitely didn't steal that one from me. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's okay that no one likes the idea. I guess if, you're, if you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. And I'm okay with that. I, I think that just having a conversation with others, because I think that you have to recognize that baseball is falling behind. So we better do something. I have to impress upon you that when you call us, you have a better phone line. Uh, David Sampson with us on 790 The Ticket. It's base sports radio. Like, it's the one thing that I need to impress upon you, that the phone line work correctly so that we can understand what you're saying when you're speaking. Um, so in those competition committees, who was bringing this stuff up? It's, the ideas are brought by Central Baseball, and then they're considered, and then they're either summarily dismissed or sent back for further study. And what the thought was, the commissioner has been really, really good about saying, hey, let's look at everything. Let's decide what kind of game we want and what we think our fans want. And there were a lot of focus groups and a lot of studies done, but there needs to be more. But the commissioner is in great position to do it. But members of the committee, all of whom are interesting and veterans, I just think there need to be other voices. There needs to be other conversation because purists are ruling the day. And I'm just not a fan of that because a lot of the tweets I got and a lot of things that people say is, well, it's never been done that way. Leave baseball alone. It's perfect. But that's just not true. It's not perfect. And we can't leave it alone. Can you explain to us what you saw when uh, the whole Andy Slater situation we were talking about last week where the Marlins revoked a press credential of a broadcaster who reported negatively on them? It's a decision that every team goes through in every sport. When Who do you open your home to? And the home is the clubhouse. And you have to decide if you're willing to say no to somebody who you don't like what they're saying. And it's very dangerous. And I'm not talking First Amendment issues. I'm talking, are you violating the rules of the Baseball Writers Association? But more importantly, are you making a bigger story out of something that could have just died on the vine? And in PR, you think about that all the time. When you react, are you just extending that story? And any time you know, Andy Slater's involved, there's going to be an extension of the story because that's what he's good for. I, first him, I, think he was, I could be wrong. I think he was selling TVs in our clubhouse back in the day <laughs> at Pro Player Stadium. So, so. Wait, wait, what? He was, wait, 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 what? No, what do you no mean, more. like coming in with TVs under his arm? Like, what are you talking about there? Listen, I, I, there's no chance that I'm right or wrong. I have some recollection of a guy named Andy Slater who's actually in my contact list under Florida Marlins TV guy. So I don't know whether he was the cable guy or selling TVs or installing TVs, I can't really remember. I just know that he was not a member of the media, 
and I'm not sure that he is currently a member of the media, but he always had scoops. He always had sources in our clubhouse. As I recall, he may have been the first one to report of Jose's death. Yes, that's um, correct. And we found that interesting because we were sitting in a room right after we got called by the Fish and Wildlife Department, and before we knew it, Andy Slater had him dead, and we didn't even know whether the family knew. So he's always had interesting connections, interesting stories, but to me it's a lot of noise signifying nothing. Did you guys ever do that, pull someone's credentials? We we certainly talked about it in the office, and uh, we, we didn't do it because we didn't think the juice was worth the squeeze. But there are times when people get under your skin and you're looking for ways to retaliate, like you realize back in the day in Montreal, it was easier without the Internet and without sort of the 24-hour news cycle that we have. It could go under the radar. But today, you just can't do it. Peyton, you're on with David Sampson, former Marlins team president. Go ahead, Peyton. Hey, Sampson, I want to review on the movie Summer Catch. It was a real blockbuster hit. What do you got for us? I didn't hear the name. Summer Catch. Don't know it. I've seen it. Diego. <laughs> Liar. Diego. What's it about? What's it about, Mina? <laughs> it's like uh, Jessica Beale's in it, Mrs. Justin Timberlake. It's a romantic comedy. It's... You sound like someone from Pearson, so I'm going to say it's not true. I believe her. That's a Yale joke. Diego, you're on with it. There's, oh, you know what? Get rid of him and his phone line. That's it. Next week we'll try well, that. Is that Diego's line? No, no. Get, get rid of everybody. That Everybody's gone. Diego, not Every, me. Everybody out of here. By the way, you fired Tommy Hutton. Uh, see you later. You fired Tommy Hutton. Yes, you did fire Tommy Hutton. <laughs> everybody out of here. We're out of time anyway. So we'll talk to you soon, Samson. That's so unfair. You fired Tommy Hutton. What does that have to do with anything? Well, I mean, he was critical of the team. You remember that whole story? David yes, just... I do. I do remember <laughs> the whole story. But he was critical of the team for many, many years before they fired him. It was the ultimate revocal of a press credential. <laughs> Is revocal a word? I don't know. I was just wondering that, too. Probably not. Mina? 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 Princeton, not, not a word. Princeton, Princeton joke uh, getting Mina. Was it revocation? Is is that the appropriate? Uh, yeah, revocation is right. Just like uh, princess is correct to call. Oh God! This yeah, again. Billy. No, hmm. again. This what are you again. talking about again? Mina's mad at me. You because... slandered me on the internet, and this is finally my chance to respond. So apparently, Dan, I don't know if you're aware of this. So I covered the royal wedding last weekend, and <laughs> covered. Yeah, did and you? I did. I covered it, and. One way to put it. And Meghan Markle, who's everyone's referring to as America's princess, is actually named the Duchess. So I was, you know, confused by this because everyone's calling her the princess, but she's actually the Duchess of Sussex. So Mina said that she wanted to learn everything about America's princess. And I said, I said it in like a joking, cute tweet. I know. Context. And then I followed back with a Stugatz reference. I said, Duchess, fine, big one. And then a lot of people were crushing her, and then I did some research, and I found out she can be both a princess and a duchess, so I apologized to Mina yesterday, but I had a feeling she was going to come after me today, because this is the move that everybody does around here. Everyone wants to be a big, tough guy, so they come and they start picking on me, and you know what? My foot is down. You know what he said to me after he apologized? Do you really want to punch down? Oh, no, yeah, no, no, I told her. I go, Mina, there's no there's no need to feud down. Like, you get nothing out of starting a feud with me whatsoever. You just, you're you going to look like a bully. You started it with me. That's the point here. And then you didn't admit to the error online. This is good. I believe she does get stuff from feuding with you. I, I believe that I feel Mina, great. Yeah, Mina doesn't do a lot of feuding and she might as she pointed out very fast upon meeting you, I'm going to attack the meekest link. Well, that's the problem. Look, just as a life principle, you shouldn't feud down cuz what do you gain? We had a detente. I had gained respect for you after you ran that the race. Yeah, I really then was like, you know, I'm not going to feud with Billy anymore. I kind of respect him. Just, <laughs> I just, I mean, just be careful today because I know a yoga secret about you, and no. if you push my buttons, no. it will come out. Oh, yes. no, that, oh, was, yes. that was told in yes. confidence. To whom? Who'd you tell in confidence? Who did you tell in confidence? Just tread lightly today. Wow. Whoa. Watch it. Find you- out the Mina Kimes yoga secret next. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter when Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more, like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh la la, aren't they multi-talented? <laughs> hey, I said organic carrots. <laughs> Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more.